Hi, and welcome to Big Questions for a dialogue on science and God. Our dialogue partners today are Professor Peter Atkins, who is Professor of Chemistry at Oxford University and the author of 65 books, 65 books, uh, including eight best-selling chemistry textbooks, which he also illustrates himself. Uh, Professor Atkins is a prominent atheist, and it's a pleasure to have you today. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Uh, on the other side of the ring is uh, Professor John Lennox, uh, who is a professor of mathematics at Oxford University and also a fellow in the philosophy of science at Green Templeton College here in Oxford. He has written uh, two monographs in the OUP series, the Oxford University Press series, and uh, over 70 peer-reviewed journal articles, and recently a book called God's Undertaker, Has Science Buried God? His answer is no because he's a prominent uh, Christian. And Professor Lennox, great to have you as well. Thank you very much. My name is Grenville Kent. I'm a Christian and a theologian, and therefore I guess I'm clearly on one side of this debate. Now, I'm not sure that an objective interviewer exists, but what I can do is to ask questions to both sides and to just really keep some sense of fairness in the time. And the way this will roll is we'll have um, a question will be given. We'll have about three minutes uh, each to discuss it. And then we'll go to more informal discussion after that for a couple more minutes each. And there's one thing we're doing differently, and that is we're not putting any cuts in this uh, program. We're shooting it live, as it were, on one camera. Now, the style of that may be not quite what you're used to, but uh, you'll see the camera moving between the speakers. Cuts can, of course, hide edits, which can hide manipulation. And we just want to be completely open-handed uh, and as fair as possible in the way that this all rolls. I hope you enjoy it. Professor Atkins, turning to you first, is there design in the universe or only apparent design? Well, if you're lazy and you just look around you, it looks like a tremendously well-organized and therefore designed environment. But if you think about it, you begin to see that you can explain what appears to be design by in broad terms, evolution. And we're going to talk a lot about evolution, quite, quite clearly. And um, so if, if you are intent upon thinking and really want to understand the nature of the world, then you have to look back at the roots of what you see. You look at the vegetation, you look at the whole biosphere. And more deeply than that, I suppose you have to look at the, um, the, the laws of physics, which really govern the biosphere ultimately, and ask whether those have been crafted in some way. And then you have to say, well, what about the universe itself? Is there design behind the whole, the whole caboodle, the whole business of the universe? And um, as science progresses, it strips away the illusion of design and shows that everything I've mentioned, uh, the biosphere, the laws of physics, and we, this is a speculation, we'll come back to the role of speculation later, um, the universe itself, none of it needs a designer to account for what we observe. It's only laziness that results in belief in design. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, turning to you, Professor Lennox, how would you answer that question? Design or apparent design? Well, the first thing I would want to say is I, I don't share Peter's feeling that it's only laziness that perceives design. In fact, some of the brightest scientists that there have been were people who functioned on the basis that there was a designer. I do think that there is a designer and I think science is part of the evidence for the existence of the designer. Indeed, as we look back at the history of science, and I've been enormously enjoying Peter's book, Galileo's Finger. Well, there was Galileo who was a believer in God and his belief in God and the idea that God had, so to speak, um, encoded uh, science in the language of mathematics far from hindering Galileo was the thing that inspired him. So as I look back at the history of science, I see that the design hypothesis 
far from hindering science, was actually what led to its rise as we understand it today. You see, I think underlying this whole business, there's a confusion of thought that it's either design or science. It's either God or science. I don't share that view at all because that's to confuse categories. God is, I believe, a personal creator. That is, he's an agent who causes the universe to exist. But science explains mechanisms. And the existence of mechanisms certainly doesn't uh, provide an argument, uh, to my mind, for the absence of an agent who designed the mechanisms. So the more science goes on, far from dispelling an illusion of design, it seems to me it increases the evidence for design rather than diminishes it. So it seems to me that the false alternatives that, that lie behind some thinking here uh, need to be teased out. It's God and science, not God or science. Well, I can take up various points there. Um, one is that the fact that ancient scientists were impelled by belief in God to do science does not actually, is not evidence for the existence of God. After all, um, uh, that religion also inspired great art. It, it's inspired great music. Uh, it doesn't mean that simply because people thought there was an entity called God and they believed in things like the Bible and so on, that there was any truth in it. You don't need an inspiration to be true in order for it to be inspiring. And when you also think about the history of science, then Galileo and Newton and uh, Robert Boyle and certainly Michael Faraday, all religious believers, deep believers, all impelled by science, but they, they didn't have in their grasp the advantages that we now have of modern science. They didn't know enough. They didn't have enough information to dispel, to support their, the view that you don't need a god. Of course, we also think about the um, the role of God as the arch architect, um, as the one who really designed the whole thing so that things can happen. You have to ask yourself whether that is simple speculation or whether there is any evidence whatsoever. And the way that you presented it is that it's simply your belief because it's comfortable to believe that there is a God behind it all. But there is not one jot of evidence that would support that hypothesis. Well, I feel that part of the evidence is uh, that history of science and the way in which science arose. As you say, quite correctly, inspiration doesn't prove a thing is true, but neither does it prove it's false. And the very noticeable um, idea that believing in a creator God as an architect of the universe and of its laws has been so fertile in producing modern science, I think it's not a knockdown mathematical proof. I think we both agree that in this whole field, you don't get knockdown mathematical proofs, you only get those in mathematics. But it is evidence pointing in the right direction. Or the wrong direction. Or the, or the wrong direction, but it seems to me it points in the right direction. And secondly, your idea that it is my belief that there is a God because it's comfortable to believe. I think the psychology of belief is a dangerous area because I could equally argue that your belief in atheism, and it is a belief, is simply a comfort as well. It was, I think, um, one of the famous Polish Nobel Prize winners who pointed out that atheism is the opium of the people because it gives us the comfort of, comforting notion that there is no God whom we'll one day have to meet. So on psychological grounds, Peter, I think uh, you can argue in both directions. So I want to go to the heart of your question, is there any evidence? And to my mind, the biggest bit of evidence is the fact that we can do science at all. We live in a rationally, mathematically intelligible universe. And nothing in atheism, it seems to me, accounts for that, whereas everything in theism accounts for it. But you see, that's 
laziness coming in again. Um, and we will so? constantly come back to this laziness because you say there is this something, there is this complicated question, this very deep question. And the deep question in this case is why mathematics works as a description of, the, of, of nature. And you say, I'll take, I'll just assert that there is a God behind it all. And that seems to me to be a terribly lazy way of approaching an explanation of the world. What I have to do as an atheist, as someone who does not see any evidence for God, is to say, can we get to the root of why mathematics works? And it's a real question. I don't deny that. And it's a wonderful question. And science is not yet able to answer it, but it is working towards it, so sort of yeah. millimetre millimeter at a time, rather than taking this giant lazy le leap to say we won't understand why there is a mathematical That's description of the world, it must be a god. That seems to me to be the um, laziness in extreme. Well, I can't speak for everybody, Peter. Uh, I mean, there may well be people that say, well, I can't explain it, therefore God did it. But I don't think I'm doing that at all. What I'm saying is the very doing of science, as science increases, is a pointer to me that the rational intelligibility of the universe has a ratio, has a mind behind it. But that's not a science stopper. That doesn't stop me investigating in every way possible. But you see, it's such a complicated view. I, I like to take the view that you should start from a simple explanation. It's an it's a, it's a Occamist view, William of Occam, saying that, you know, don't add hypotheses, get, try to get away with the simplest possible explanation. So I, as a scientist, I, as an atheist, say, I want to see whether a minimal assumption of maximum simplicity uh, can be deployed to account for everything that can be known and is known. And I will add to that bony skeleton of a hypothesis, flesh, only if flesh is shown to be needed. And I think God counts as flesh. And if, if science can show that there is nothing that cannot be explained by not invoking without invoking the hypothesis of God, then that there is no need to impose God on the explanation, except through sentiment and all the other things that drive religious belief, like fear of one's own annihilation, um, worrying about the origins of morality, worrying about how people would behave if, if they thought there was no God. All that sort of stuff is jam on my toast. We'll come to the jam later, and it's a very interesting, interesting comment. Can we get down to a specific, perhaps, piece of toast? Um, I read you from uh, Anthony Flew's book, There is a No, crossed out, A God, and uh, he talks about, um, in 2004, uh, speaking in New York, and, and actually, as a famous atheist, turning around and saying, well, actually, I've now changed my opinion. They asked him, uh, does recent work on the origin of life point to the activity of a creative intelligence? And he says, yes, I now think it does. It was a major change. Uh, almost entirely because of the DNA investigations. What I think the DNA material has done is that it has shown, by the almost unbelievable complexity of the arrangements which are needed to produce life, that intelligence must have been involved in getting these extraordinarily diverse elements to work together. It's the enormous complexity of the number of elements and the enormous subtlety of the ways they work together. The meeting of these two parts at the, parts at the right time, by chance, is simply minute. And so he, uh, he founds his belief in God, although to my knowledge he hasn't yet said which kind or who, um, on, on that belief. Um, is that a rational basis for, for belief? Well, he's a philosopher. <laughs> and philosophers don't really understand the, the nature of the world. I mean, scientists understand the nature of the world. Um, I, I've, I've alluded on another occasion to uh, the difference between philosophers and scientists, that scientists are optimists. They think that there is going to be an explanation, and they're driven 
not necessarily by belief in God, but they're driven because of their belief in the, in the likelihood that a rational explanation will observe, be observed. Philosophers, I'm afraid, are pessimists because they are always putting the brake on knowledge by saying that um, you, you, this is not the sort of question to ask. We can't expect an answer to this kind of question. Uh, we are human, we're trapped in, in our human carapace and we can't break out of it. And so they are the, the, the pessimists. And so, um, of course, worst of all are theologians because they, they add obfuscation. <laughs> and so philosophers have to come along and strip away um, theological obfuscation and then scientists come along to give the real answers, the believable answers, the evidentially based answers to questions and therefore the reliable answers. Now, um, Flew's remark there shows a total lack of understanding of the power of evolution and its mechanism, which is largely a natural selection. It's an extraordinarily powerful way of um, permitting, I use that word advisedly maybe, permitting change to take place by random exploration. Some of those random explorations end up in the organism's death because we call them disease. But some of them enable it to survive just a little bit better and go on to replicate themselves. And so we have that story of the gradual accumulation of complexity that uh, evolution enables. Um, and even though DNA is the most complex molecule that we know, there's no reason to suppose that it cannot have been developed by simple chemical processes, uh, amplified and welded into the environment and propagated by evolution and natural selection. So complexity, even awesome complexity, can arise by chance, by seeming chance. And the, the, the root of evolution is chance, but um, a, a happy accident sometimes leads to sur greater survivability and greater reducibility. And so complexity gradually grows. There is nothing mysterious about DNA. And to assert that an intelligence must have lain behind it is simply the musings of a senile philosopher or the, the meanderings of a lazy mind, I'm afraid. OK, thank you. Would you like to respond? I to would. That? I'd love to. I wouldn't be as hard on philosophers and theologians as Peter. Perhaps he's had a bad experience of them. I, I, I just don't know. But certainly, I, I don't think that all of them uh, reject evidence-based thinking, certainly not in my experience. And in my contact with Anthony Flew, which was relatively recent, I don't think his thinking is the result of uh, a lazy mind or a senile mind at all. What strikes me about this is... It is the result of someone not understanding that molecular biophysics. <laughs> no, I, I, I'm not convinced at all by that for, for the following uh, reasons, that DNA is not a product of evolution because evolution assumes that there exists a mutating replicator. But the origin of that mutating replicator is a completely different thing. And uh, I'm sure, Peter, you're aware that Darwin's theory does not cover that at all. We're talking here about the origin of life itself. And it seemed to me that what you were talking about was what happens when life gets going. But the basic insight is, it seems to me, this, that if I pick up, say, a book here, Galileo's Finger, and I look at it, 
even if I only see the top part, Peter Atkins, I immediately infer, because of the semiotic nature of what's written here, the linguistic nature of the writing, whatever automatic processes may have been involved in the production of this book, I immediately infer, because of the nature of the complexity of just those dozen or so letters, that there is ultimately a mind behind it. And therefore, I, I do not think it unscientific to make that inference but this is when we watch, look at DNA. This is Paley's watch argument. But Paley's watch argument uh, is not a bad argument, is it? It's in itself, it's, it's, it's extraordinarily it's, it's, it's accurate, it seems the, to me. It's the laziest argument in science. But it's not lazy. It Peter, is. what is wrong with me taking your book and inferring an intelligence behind it? Is that not a rational argument? That's not lazy. Well, I hope in this case it's true. Exactly. <laughs> sure <it is>. and, <laughs> and the interesting thing is this, that that's quite simple as you look at it. Yeah. But I have to postulate you, who are much more complex than this, yeah. as the author of that. That's the only explanation that makes sense. So that contradicts, it seems to me, or goes against your prior argument that you've got to start with the simplest thing possible and then build up. It seems to me there are certain things in science that science has revealed, by the way, uh, that indicate, point towards a mind. You see, if I have the choice between a mind as the ultimate origin of DNA, whatever mechanisms come in between, and randomness, as you say, chance, it, it seems to me there's no contest. The more scientific thing is that, is that a mind lies behind it, not pure chance. No, it's not the more scientific thing. What, because you're implicitly imposing purpose on the emergence of an entity. No, I'm saying it indicates purpose in, in the way in which it emerges. Well, I'm, yes, it's, it's pointing but, that but, direction. But, but there is lying behind your... Your, your remarks, a view that somehow or other purpose comes into the game. That's right, as it does when I see the cover of your book. Yes. Would that not be unreasonable? Absolutely, but, but, there, <laughs> but um, there are differences between a book which is clearly the creation of a human brain yes. and the a even rock. more complicated DNA. Oh yes, and a rock certainly, but the difference between a rock and DNA and lies in the nature of the complexity of the two. They're but, both complex. But there is no purpose behind the emergence of DNA. But that's your belief. Yeah, but it, it, that's is, your faith. it is a more fundamental belief. And if I can account for the emergence of DNA... But without, can you? Let me finish the yes. remark. If, if I could account for the emergence of DNA without requiring there to be a purposeful intention behind it, then it, that to me indicates that purpose is not necessary. Now, in this instance, a, a strip of DNA, I mean, our DNA is several meters long yes. and, and of great complexity. So, As e you describe very well in e your e book, e by e the e way. E even the DNA of, 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 of a cockroach is very, very complicated. Mm. So let's not talk about ourselves, let's talk about cockroaches and things. Or just DNA. Or oh, DNA. I'm not asserting, and no one ever asserts, except the creationists who really don't understand it any more than someone like Anthony Flew understands it. Um, um, no one asserts in their right mind that a strip of DNA suddenly occurred out of nothing. What, what emerged was initially a fairly complicated molecule, somehow or other, and we'll come back to that if you want to, which in due course led to the emergence of little strips of molecular material, which as life became established and evolution took over, gradually accumulated complexity. And it ended up with four meters of complexity, you and I. Um, but initially, life was not based on DNA, almost certainly, and no one quite knows how the initial replicating entity molecule emerged. I have to admit that. But I also have to ask you to accept that scientists have not run out of ideas about how that 
initial replicating entity emerged. Lots and lots of ideas around. There's lots of candidate molecules. There's lots of candidate procedures. And although you might say that science is sort of hedging its bets by saying, wait for the future, and then we'll come up with the, the right answer, um, science will come up with its answer on this side of the grave, whereas religion, on the whole, preserves its answers for the other side. <laughs> Well, there are several, like to several big issues there, Peter. Um, first of all, I, I think that you're quite right. Science is not hard up for ideas. But the developments over the last 50 years since the discovery, or more than 50 years now since the discovery of the double helix in DNA, I would have thought indicate more and more that postulating, as well as various mechanisms, molecular mechanisms and so on, postulating a mind is much more rational today than it was in the days before we knew anything about DNA. Lasers and again, no, see. not at all, because it's not an either or. I'm, you see, you seem to imply that my view stops science. Absolutely. You, not you see, at all. See, that's the antithesis. It doesn't. It the doesn't. An, the, an, the antithesis is that a religious explanation is in terms of an unknowable complexity. That is the, the mind of God, if you like. Whereas a science, scientific explanation is in terms of a knowable simplicity. But you're and presenting I them think, as alternatives. Well, they are. But they're I not mean, alternatives. An, an unknowable complexity is clearly an, an alternative to a knowable simplicity. Ah, but half a minute. The, the, the unknowable, and of course that's your assumption, I believe God can be known, so I don't uh, grant that pre premise for a start. But the unknown complexity that is God is an agent when Newton discovered gravity, he said, he didn't say, marvelous, I now know how it works, therefore I don't need God. In fact, he praised God to such an extent he wrote the most brilliant book, and I think we both agree that Principia Mathematica is the most brilliant book that's ever appeared in science. The word God doesn't appear in it. No, but he, it does in the sense that on the dedication, he uh, suggested that he hoped that this book would persuade the thinking man to believe in a deity. His science was not pitted against his belief in God. And I would love somehow to try to convey that to you because um, I'm very much for science. I am a mathematician after all and rejoice in Ooh, science that doesn't and so give on. Me confidence. Well, I notice your praise of mathematicians <laughs> in, in, in your book here. And Galileo wasn't a, wasn't, wasn't a bad one either, and Newton and so on. But the, the bottom line, it seems to me, is that an explanation must actually explain what's going on. Now, listening to you, I, I've heard what sounds to me in a way like a kind of fairy story. You have DNA exists, you've got to explain it. Now your basic faith assumption is that it's got to be explicable irreducibly in terms of natural processes, Absolutely. full stop. Well, that's fine, go right ahead. What I'm saying is this, that as well as natural processes, it seems to me that there are certain things in life that point beyond but to the existence of a mind. That's just wishful thinking. Not at see. all. But you might be saying it's just wishful thinking that you will, in the end, explain everything yeah, in terms of purely natural. That, that's wishful thinking. Uh, yeah, but, it, but it's a challenge to science to show that it can account for everything w without invoking the, a, an external agent, which we can call God for, for brevity. And I think it is... It's a, it's a great challenge, and I think science is showing that it's capable of it. There's at no point... That is if it's true, but has, what if it's false? At no point has science ever made progress by asserting that a god is necessary. See, oh, it, that's not true, surely, Peter. The whole rise of modern science uh, with Newton and no. Galileo, we both agree. They asserted that God existed, and that set Galileo. I mean, one of the things that really yeah, struck that, me about that, that your book. Sim that simply stimulated them to. Well, to, isn't that a very positive thing? It no. didn't stop their science; it stimulated it. Yeah, but I can believe in in, in the tooth fairy. 
Oh, but half a minute, the tooth fairy has stimulated no science. Belief in a creator well, God has... Well, speak Well, I might have... Been, all right, I will speak well, for myself. Yes, when I was a child, I might have thought, well, you know, the tooth fairy can, can do something or other, do magic. I'm going to see if I can do magic. That, it, that led me into being a scientist. I think the, you know, God is just a, um, an institution. Are you saying that's what happened to you? I, I'm pretending that. Oh, right, okay. okay. Um, and, but so God is just, if you like, an institutionalized tooth fairy, no more than that. But that's, that, that's actually nonsense. That's, that's a delusion, it seems to me. God is far from an institutionalized tooth fairy because there is evidence for the existence of God. There isn't. There is not one jot of evidence. The only evidence there is is um, f failure to come to terms with one, the prospect of one's own annihilation fear. Um, what else? The fact that there is a universe, which certainly suggests that there might be a mind behind it, which I, of course, dispute. Um, nothing Wait else. A minute. There is a universe that suggests there might be a mind behind it. Yeah. I said, you accept that. Well, no, that's one absolutely. pointer then in the right direction. Y yeah, true. But I would say that to accept that there is a mind is throwing in the scientific towel. It's kind of intellectual laziness and so on. But that has but there's not no true historically there's no or currently. There's no other evidence for the existence of God. But how do you explain, for example, the existence, leaving out present company, uh, of people who've won the Nobel Prize and believe in God? The, the I find that extraordinary. I think you've touched on probably the second mystery of the universe. The, the first mystery is where it all came from. Yeah. And the second is why you know, seemingly intelligent, well-informed scientists can still believe in the nonsense that theology but Peter, and belief in God. They would represent. claim, as I would claim, in my much lower level. See, they're incomplete scientists. No, they're not incomplete scientists. It, it, it's, it, I get the impression from reading what you write that you think science uh, can solve every problem, that it's limitless. Absolutely. So you do think that. Well, I think that's simply false. Science doesn't deal with, uh, see, with morality. Yes, it does. Of course, science deals with morality. It doesn't deal with them in the sense it gives it a, a justifiable origin. Yes, it does. Because I'd love to pick up those questions in a okay, moment. Okay, right. We're, 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 <laughs> this is thoroughly enjoying watching the tennis here. Yeah. Um, and we might leave the tooth fairy to the, to the dentist and, okay. and uh, look at DNA. Um, <clears throat> reading from this excellent book, Galileo's Finger, a DNA molecule is a store of information, essentially a message, handed down through the generations. That message contains all the information needed to construct and sustain the organism it inhabits. The obvious questions are what that information is, how it is encoded, and how it is interpreted. When you say information, I'd be interested in, in a clarification there. <clears throat> I'm not trying to twist that word. If I heard it in the sense of Francis Collins, he would say that information is the language of God. It's, it's information just as uh, written text is information. Is that the way you intended that to be understood? Well. All of us are structures. All of us are structures um, built to a plan. And um, I will use that word advisedly. And <laughs> so, well, it's with, encouraging with, so with, far. With, with some caution. <laughs> and so there must be um, a way in which the plan can be carried from um, generation to generation and implemented. And really, we organisms are entities that can interpret the plan that is handed on from generation to generation with modification uh, in DNA. Um, of course there's information because otherwise we would just be a kind of a bowl of soup on the ground. Um, we're structured and so we have to have rules for the organization of proteins. Proteins must know what how to build themselves. They must know how to go about their business. And I say no in that kind of anthropomorphic sense. Mm. Um, and so structures need to emerge from, if you like, the food that we ingest. So the food that we ingest simply has to be um, dismantled and then reconstructed. Uh, so that the organism can thrive and then, in due course, in many cases, go on to, to, to reproduce. So information 
is really structural information. Mm -hmm. The question, that I, my follow-up question to that, and let me give you, let me give you three minutes uh, or, uh, to, to have a clear go at that, is does information require intelligence or, or can it arise uh, by other means? Um, well, there's a, um, su suppose there was only um, vegetation on Earth, no animals, uh, no brains, in other words, and no overt intelligence. And I'm using intelligence now in the sense of things with brains. I'm not using intelligence in the sense of a cosmic intelligence behind it all. So just simple, straightforward intelligence. So if, if, um, if the world was inhabited only by corn, um, then it would still be information enabling the corn to have emerged from the seed and to undergo modification and reproduce to give different sorts of... So there's information everywhere. Uh, so you don't need intelligence to, um, to identify it. Well, you need, I suppose, intelligence to identify it. It, it, it can exist without intelligence. It, it can exist without having been caused by intelligence? Well, if we just stick to this um, uh, world of vegetation, brain, this brainless world of vegetation, then there is no intelligence embedded in that. But that's begging but, the question as to whether the whole thing was caused by yes, intelligence. Yes, but I, I did say I was using intelligence in two different forms. And so if we trace back that cornfield to you know, the original replicating molecule, whatever that was, there, there was no intelligence of this, let's call it secondary kind, the kind that we, ex that we, we possess, <laughs> um, uh, along the whole of that evolutionary story. So, but there was information at every stage, and information was um, being modified and, and interpreted at every stage. So, um, in terms of intelligence type two, that certainly is not necessary. Then, of course, we have to consider um, intelligence type one, um, cosmic intelligence, designer intelligence, um, some kind of um, Gucci Armani intelligence behind it all. Um, why should there be? I, I know that John will be saying, of course, the fact that we, can, we, we are ourselves intelligent probably stems from the ultimate cosmic intelligence type one. But there's no evidence for that. It's only speculation. And speculation without evidence seems to me to be empty. So um, intelligence type one, not one iota of, intel of um, evidence for, for it. Uh, even the fact that we're here, even the fact that we're pretty good mathematicians, even the fact that, we, that the universe is comprehensible, all these are very deep and interesting questions. None of these requires there to be intelligence behind it all. All of it could have emerged uh, by um, accident of birth. Thank you. OK. Uh, Professor Lennox, let me give you the, the same question. Does the existence of information in the natural world imply or, or necessitate a mind behind it? Oh, I, I, I think it does. And I certainly don't think it could emerge by accident of birth. I think if one wants to believe that, one can, but one is going way beyond science, and I don't think there's a, a shred of evidence for that either. The uh, world of corn, uh, if we have a world of corn, there is the DNA that encodes this information. And one of the things I find very fascinating is that information itself is not material. It's a very abstract uh, concept, and I'm almost amused that we've lived now to the stage where one of the fundamental concepts that is used not only in biological science is an immaterial concept. And irrationality, in my book, doesn't give rise to rationality. The burden of proof is on those who claim that it does. The evidence of the existence of DNA, of the human mind, of the ability to do mathematics, 
the latter goes way beyond anything evolution can account for. The notion that abstract pure mathematics invented centuries ago can now be found to relate to the universe is something that is not required for reproductive su success or anything that evolution shows. So I really feel that the shred of evidence quote that Peter likes to use uh, the shoes of the other foot, there isn't a shred of evidence that you can account ultimately. And I use the word ultimately advisedly because, of course, there are all kinds of mechanisms involved and we can tease them out. That's the fascination of science. But the whole endeavor seems to me to have a big uh, pointer and it points towards an ultimate intelligence. And part of the fun of science is the thinking God's thoughts after him. It's not a science stopper, it's a science encourager. Well, <laughs> I, mean, I mean, I disagree with um, so much of that that I've almost forgotten what, what points I wanted to, <laughs> to, to, to attack. I think um, I will come clean. I think the deepest question of existence is where it all came from. Mm. How? Why from, is there something rather than nothing? In a word. Yes. How from absolutely nothing, mm. not just empty space time. Yes, absolutely could nothing. Yeah. The, the world seemed to be present. Okay. Mm. And um, I'm also interested in the thought, which you've also touched on, that um, the incredibility of the fact that mathemat mathematics seems to be the language of discourse for, um, for discussing the world and for pushing theorems forward and, and coordinating ideas and so on. And I think that um, I, I, I would certainly speculate, and in one of these books I did speculate, that the reason why the mathematics does account, can be used to account for everything in the world, is that in some sense the world is just mathematics. And I, so this is certainly not the place, and we didn't have the time to, to un, 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 unwrap that thought. But I think deep down the, the world is a kind of mathematical structure. And when you start thinking that way, you can begin to see how um, what seems to be real reality can emerge from absolutely nothing because it is, for example, possible in mathematics to construct the integers. And once you've got the integers, you can do mathematics by forcing them to do things that they weren't intended to do. <laughs> um, once you've got the integers, you can create the integers from the null set, from absolutely nothing. So. In a sense, there's a deep analogy there of the emergence of the mathematics from the null set, from absolutely nothing. Just as we are troubled by the question of the real world emerging from the void. And um, although I'm now speculating far beyond the domain of, of current science, it may give a hint that science will be able to account for the emergence of the world from absolutely nothing. And it's also conceivable that, you know, the, um, in a sense, just as mathematics can tumble out of nothing without intervention, so the reality of the world can also tumble out of the void without intervention. And to conclude that remark by I now remembered what I wanted to, uh, to say, although it's um, sort of kind of um, a fleeting thing that is hard for me uh, still to grasp, and it's, and I, it's escaped me entirely again. So go on talking about yeah. yourself. Okay. Okay. <laughs> well, let, let me come back at this. Question, yeah. Yes, let yeah. me come back at this. You see, uh, what I find intriguing about Peter's answer is Mathematics doesn't come tumbling out of absolutely nothing. The concept of the null set is not absolutely nothing. And it takes a creative mind to develop the mathematics out of what he calls absolutely nothing. So the analogy would be that the universe can, by a creative mind, be created out of absolutely nothing. That's point number one. Point number two is the universe reflects mathematical structures. But I think we want to realize that mathematics 
doesn't cause anything. Newton's laws describe what will happen. They don't cause motion. And it seems to me that's a profound mistake that I, I, I see in a number of books as if mathematics could create the universe. I mean, two plus two equals four, but that never put four pounds in my pocket. It doesn't create anything. And I would go back to the fact that I agree with Peter. On the basis of a naturalistic science, it is a vast mystery of how we have this universe. And I would go further that and I say that the only answer to it that makes sense to me well, that's is... No, 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 just a minute. I'm not finished yet. We can explore the mechanisms as much as we like, but our explorations and the very way we do them is, as a totality, pointing towards a mind behind them. And that didn't hinder science in the 17th century, and it needn't hinder science now. I think the point is this, that... Again, it's a fundamental confusion that lies at the heart of our discussion. It's a confusion between God as agent and creator and the mechanisms that science started out. One of the fascinating things, I think, about the Bible, and I haven't mentioned it before. Peter says there's not a shred of evidence for God. I would want, of course, to bring much more than science uh, into uh, the picture as evidence for God. But... The Bible actually encourages science. According to the story in Genesis, taxonomy, giving names to things, was encouraged by God. And all science is involved in giving names to things. And I think to see believing in God the Creator as antipathetic to science, that is just false. It's a category mistake. Mm. You see, I think it's... I wish I could reverse history. Um, I, I wish, and this is really getting down to the point, that um, if we, we have to struggle with the fact that science follows religious explanation, science emerged from the chrysalis that we call religion. Um, and so we're having to fight all these ingrained attitudes, this, for a word, this lazy approach to understanding. Um, had it been the other way around, it, it, so had you know, science become established before religion had started to emerge in the mind of men, then theologians would have to come along trying to convince us that we needed a god. And I think that would be an awful uphill struggle. I think that had we got in first, rather than have to display, try to displace a primitive form of understanding, which is we all have to accept is represented by belief in God, um, uh, uh, had science got in first, we wouldn't have to try to displace this ingrained attitude to, to explain. But Peter, we can reverse I mean, history. We're sophisticated. I mean, we might sound arrogant, but we're not arrogant. We're, what we really are is deeply humble because we realize that working collectively together without kowtowing to the authority of people who claim to have special powers, the ear, the eye, the mouth of God. Humanity working collectively together can burrow into the fabric of the cosmos and understand it and come to an understanding of why it works the way it works and in due course why it is there in the first place, rather how it came to be there in the first place. I think um, humanity should be deeply proud that it has gone, worked through this, the primitive stage of understanding, which is absolutely essential in a, in, for the intellectual advance of humanity. They had to go through the demons phase, they had to go through the angels phase, but having emerged from it by showing the power of collective thought, building bridgeheads on firm foundation, relying upon objective evidence rather than just subjective hallucination, uh, mankind is getting to understand 
everything about its environment. And I think that's wonderful. But Peter, uh, we can't reverse history, as you say, but we can reverse it on the personal level. There's a book sitting right there called The Language of God by Francis Collins. He started off in atheism. His slate was written on by atheism to start with. And he came to the conclusion, as people like C.S. Lewis did, and Alistair McGrath, who was here, did, and many other people did, um, that the evidence for God is so strong that they abandoned their atheism. And I have seen this happen in colleagues and friends of mine. So I just think your argument doesn't hold water. The issue for all of us is yeah. what is true. Yeah, but in their cases, it's early stage senility, I think. But it's very easy to write it off like that. If I just said that was the same yeah. of atheism, you want but a comfort. Not, I mean, no, but what, what, what comfort does atheism give you? It gives you the comfort that you never have to meet God. I'll ask you about that in a second. I, I really want to go there in, in yeah. depth. That's a great question. And um, Professor Atkins, I will never forget reading, and in the 80s when I was a, when I was a theological student, actually, um, this book, The Creation, which you kindly just autographed for me, um, a great deal of the, page one, this, now this is, this is an English uh, piece of writing, I tell you. A great deal of the universe does not need any explanation. Elephants, for instance. Once molecules have learned to compete and to create other molecules in their own image, elephants and things resembling elephants will in due course be found roaming through the countryside. Can I ask you, and I've, I've wanted to for a long time, <laughs> is that a little bit like saying once the letters of the alphabet have appeared, and learn to compete and create words and lines and sentences and rhymes, Shakespeare plays will in due course be found on the bookshelf. No, not at all, because um, uh, putting letters together, to, as we used um, heard earlier, is, requires an intelligence. Uh, letters don't compete against each other. Words don't compete against each other for survival. Uh, so there isn't the same sort of evolutionary pressure on on literature as there is in the um, organic world. Uh, so the, that sort of analogy is completely false. Um, uh, literature is the product of the human brain and it's a great delight that the human brain is such a versatile instrument really that it can do literature, it can do felony, it can, it can do mathematics um, and it could do theology and it can do science. I mean, it's an extraordinarily versatile instrument largely through the complexity that has emerged um, through natural selection, really. All power for natural selection. Don't underestimate the extraordinary power of natural selection in, in drawing out tiny advantages. Is there a way in which, though, the spelling in DNA is analogous to that of, of words and of, of letters? You can draw that in, in analogy if you like. And um, clearly it's a four-letter alphabet. Mm. Um, but and in a sense, you could say that it forms some kind of sentence in a kind of very notional uh, an analogy sense. I don't think it gets you very far. I think the, the whole point about DNA is that it, um, it's a chemical guide through RNA to the emergence of proteins, which are really the worker molecules of, of, the, of, of, of an organism. Um, and so um, the, you, you can begin to draw analogies. You can begin to wonder why the alphabet is just four letters, and people have speculated about that and four letters does seem to not to be a, a very economical and um, structured choice I was going to say I hesitated to say choice there because I knew that someone would jump on me but, <laughs> but, but we have to use um, you know, anthropomorphic language and other, otherwise what we're saying just gets too long-winded um, and so uh, nature stumbled on the efficacy of a four-letter code and that's what we're stuck with. That's a wonderful belief, isn't it? But it is a belief. Yeah, Na nature it's a, it's, stumbled on it. It's what? a primitive belief, you yeah, see, no, but and I accept that my ideas are primitive and I'm proud that they're primitive. 
if you want to lard them, if you want to sort of put more egg into the custard. But to say nature so. stumbled on it is just to say I have no explanation of it. No, 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 what no, I no, find no, 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 no. When nature stumbles on something, it means that at an atomic level, an atom moved by chance. But it, then, because that movement of an atom led to a particular slightly different protein, maybe, and a slightly different organism, with an organism with greater powers of survival and reproducibility to pass, upon, pass on its advantages. That's what I mean by stumbles but, on. But there is no teleological sense of being guided towards a particular... But that's a fantastic assumption you make. You have, no, I'm, you I'm, have I'm, no actual I'm, evidence I'm, for this. I'm simple-minded. But you've no evidence for I it. I accept that I'm simple-minded. I accept that <laughs> I... Well, that's a double-barreled statement. I want simple <laughs> explanations. And yeah, but there may not be if, an ultimately if, if, simple explanation. If, if I find that every explanation that is, in my view, simple, that is, and by definition, I suppose, not involving external intervention, I think that's what we mean by simple, um, that depends just upon the workings out casually of the laws of nature, then... Wherever the, they came from. Wherever they came from, and I can talk about that too if you want me to. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I think mm -hmm. that satisfies me. I don't need suddenly a magician to appear, pull but, back the curtain and say, it was I, after all. Ah, but uh, it's very interesting, the bit that you read out earlier from the book Creation, it's marvellous English, and I have take my hat off to Peter as a writer, but it sounds to me like fiction. The, uh, or fantasy, because what what is being done? It's in allegory. The, yeah. Well, it's attributing creative powers to matter, and there's no evidence that they have these powers to organise themselves into language-like structures. You simply believe that, but as a scientist, no, I would something. want to see where is the evidence that you can get rationality out of irrationality. You've presented none so far. Well, look around. You here. simply said. But, ah, but, but we the know, fact but, that, it exi that life we, exists doesn't uh, mean that your explanation of it is correct. I haven't heard an explanation of it. I've heard simply stories that various atoms bump around and so on, but we've never seen that happen to produce life. Oh, sorry, are we now talking about the emergence we're talking, of life? No, yeah. are, so are we talking about the emergence of life? Yes, are we talking about the propagation of life? Oh, the emergence of life. Okay, so it's quite you're, clear you're, that evolution you're, you're, does many things in, you're in the variation. That, you're happy that um, the evolution of life will occur at, at an unguided Natur level. Natural selection, uh, what, originally molecular evolution? No, I'm not happy about it at all because I see no evidence for it. But you're you're claiming that your approach is scientific, but you just no, said... I, 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 but I want to distinguish and clarify our thinking for a moment. I want mm -hmm. to say, okay, shall we talk about the origin of life, or shall we talk about the evolution of life? Oh, the origin of life. So That's where the big question okay, is. But you, can, if, let me just be clear in my own mind. You are satisfied that the evolution of life account, is accounted for by largely natural selection, and takes place at a molecular level according to the laws of chemistry and physics. I am happy that what Darwin observed occurred, that is, that even natural selection and mutation do something. And we can leave it at that for the purpose of the argument. I'm not convinced that it can do everything. But e even it though does something. Uh, so That's clear. It accounts for variation. The issue so you is at stake in our discussion yeah. is existence. That's what we should be talking about because uh, yeah, that's what but, your book was talking about. Well, it's talked about both things, and I think it's very important to be clear about what we're talking about. I yeah. know this is largely a theological discussion, in which case we don't need to be clear about what we're talking about. Oh, yes, we do. But, but since we actually that's, want it to that's be... That's very assigned, unfair to it, say that. Some of the greatest minds in history have been theological minds. Uh, wasted, I'm afraid. St. Augustine... Fantastic mind, totally <laughs> wasted. I think where science would be now if he'd done, if he'd spent his but time. But if there is experiment. a God, Peter, his his mind has not been wasted. Ah, the yes, shoes yes. on the other foot. So the thing that concerns me is the truth of the matter. The wings on the other shoulder, I think. The wings the on the other shoulder, yeah. if you like yeah. to put it that way. But what I'm interested in is truth. Aren't we all? 
Well, I'm glad to hear it, yeah. that we believe That's in the concept of truth, and we could we even are. ask where that comes from, and, and order, out of irrationality. And in order to identify truth, one needs to be clear about the nature of the question that, is, that one is asking. Mm -hmm. And so what I wanted to do is to clarify the point that we are turning away from the process of evolution, which of course is driven by the laws of chemistry and physics, ultimately, and is, if you like... Is driven by them or is satisfied by them? Is, 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 is drawn along by the ability to survive, that is, natural selection. But at a molecular level is totally unconscious. So let's put that on one side because I think we're sort of agreed on that, even though you would say that an architect needed to build DNA. Um, I think that's, that's, that's nonsense, but that, you know, we'll agree to it. It's that. not nonsense, Peter. Uh, no, uh, it's I, not nonsense. Uh, uh, it no, makes no, perfect sense. No, I, I said I think it's nonsense, so you can't I think. That. Well, now, uh, so let's now turn to the other question that I think you wanted to talk about, on which I am on much slimier, slippery grounds. That, I will accept, that of the origin of life. Mm. That is how inanimate matter, in some sense, gave rise to matter that, in due course, evolved into us. And whatever we're going to go to. Now, that's a really interesting question. It's not a very deep question. I think you have to distinguish deep from interesting questions. And deep questions are you know, about where the universe came from, the nature of morality and so on. Interesting questions are much more numerous than that, and they include how can a simple series of chemical reactions taking place in an unguided way result in a molecule capable of its own replication? Absolutely. That's what we're looking for. Mm, absolutely. And the answer to that will come from um, the current laws of... We already know from chemistry and physics that ordinary, simple, stupid little molecules can organize themselves into mm -hmm. rather complex structures without intervention. Yeah, but not language-like structures. And I see no reason why... Um, Simple molecules like um, nucleic acids and so on, proteins, RNA, um, the, the, the primitive precursors of those, like the, um, the amino acids and so on, all those can come into existence by straightforward chemical activity, unguided. Now, it is certainly the case, and perhaps catalyzed by the presence of particular types of clay in the environment and so on. Scientists are not short of ideas and are doing experiments on the emergence of self-replicating molecules. We're not going to rush in and say, oh, this question is too big for our, uh, uh, for a human mind to understand. It must be God who flipped us from the inorganic into the organic. Scientists will say, let's do a whole series of experiments. Let's really see replicating the environment that existed all those billions of years ago to see whether under those circumstances, without intelligent intervention, self-replicating molecules can emerge. And if they can, then we get elements. And then if we get elements, or sorry, if, if they can, we get elephants. It's just as you read out a moment ago. Do you think it's an illegitimate thing from a scientific perspective, Peter, to see whether scientifically one can establish whether intelligence needs to be involved um, in the origin well, of life? Well, I think the scientific method is to, um, is, is Occam, again, to see whether you can account for everything that is reliably yeah, known um, yeah. w without elaborating the hypothesis. And 
Um, so let's just take the laws of nature. Um, do you, um, if you want to talk about those, we will. Let's just take the laws of nature as, as available and seeing that letting them run free in the environment that we can speculate existed. We've got evidence for the type of, evident, of environment that existed billions of years ago. Um, uh, seeing whether that sort of process leads to, to life. And if it does, that seems to me to abnegate the need for the imposition of intelligence. And if it doesn't? Then uh, if we go on trying, we may have to try for a hundred years. But, 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 and if we, in the end, come to the conclusion that, um, that an external intelligence must have done it, then we will have to accept that. Would you be prepared to accept that? No, because I think that... <laughs> I thought um, you said it, we'd have to. Yeah, but I'm going to... Um, be, so your atheism uh, doesn't gonna, depend on your science then? Oh, it does. But it also, um, I, I, I think it would show if we failed, if we had to impose intelligence at some point, it would show that um, we, we run up against a, a wall of having insufficient intelligence to But, but to why should it, out. Peter? What would be the difference in me lifting up your book and saying that implies that whatever physical processes are behind this book, there's an intelligence behind it? Because it's lazy and, and it's, it's a false <laughs> analogy. It's a false analogy. It's not lazy. Well, it you, is. Uh, how is it a false analogy? Well, it's both lazy and a false analogy. It's the only explanation that makes sense of this book. Of a book, I agree. Yes, it's not lazy. No, but you're talking about a book. And then, and then I, I'm thinking of DNA. Yeah, that's well, the Well, where's analogy. the falsity of the that, analogy? That's the false the analogy. The DNA is a longer word than Peter Atkins. Yeah, but I didn't put a lot of words into a bucket, stir them round, and hope that they exactly. And so, exactly. But I did, in, in times past, put a lot of amino acids, a lot of phosphates, a lot of nitrogen compounds and so on, and stir them all around. And because of the power of natural selection, there emerged DNA. But natural selection the doesn't analogy. work until you've got the, the replicating thing. Yeah, but it needs to be DNA initially. I mean, so well, um, uh, RNA, there's the RNA world that preceded DNA, and RNA is a very much simpler molecule. So we're working back. See, uh, scientists, well, theologians rush in where scientists hesitate to tread. And I um, haven't noticed any hesitation <laughs> of so the scientists you, you, rushing in. You rush in with an explanation, which is that there's a God who did it. I say. But I'm not saying that's an exhaustive explanation. What I'm, nor am I saying is a scientific explanation. What I'm saying is the whole study, the mathematics, what we've discovered points towards a mind. Let's get on with elaborating, elucidating the mechanisms. My belief in God uh, doesn't stop that going on at all. You're claiming that it ought to or it should. It makes it more fascinating, not less fascinating. Well, what can I say? <laughs> you want to say something? No, I, I was just going to move us on to the next, rush on to the That's next what I thought. as a theologian. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, and it would be this. The mathematics or the probability of that first occurrence of life through you can't calculate chemical solvent. You can't calculate mathematical probabilities in that way for it. I mean, that's, mm. or you get a load of um, uh, pretend, uh, pretend calculations, you know, storms, in a junkyard giving rise to a 747. All total nonsense, absolute nonsense. What, why so? Well, well, because life didn't begin, uh, 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 you don't build a, a 747 by going to a, a scrapyard and building it. it a, a 747 has emerged by a lot of design, um, building on what um, people have learned, that is, um, structures that have survived and so on. So it's a conscious design process building from primitive aircraft back in the 1900s to the highly complex ones that we all travel in today. Um, there, of course, there's conscious design. Um, and we, we have to accept that there is conscious design in the universe and most of that conscious design is due to the activity of human brains. Um, but um, 
original chemical reactions going on three or four billion years ago on this planet, and perhaps even earlier on other planets, were not designed. They were chemical reactions that stumbled into structures that were valuable precursors for molecules that were sufficiently complex to be able to replicate themselves. Would you like to speak to the maths of, of that, the probability of, of that? Probabilities, I agree with Peter to a certain extent. Not, they, are, they are, well, I don't think that's true. One of the interesting things, probabilities are dangerous actually. Um, but it interests me that people like Richard Dawkins and so on at least take probability seriously enough to say that life cannot have evolved simply by chance. And they will argue that natural selection uh, increases probability and so on. It's a law-like thing. That by sheer chance things don't happen. The other, the other thing that I would say is people talk on the side of the probability of God. And Dawkins has a chapter in this, how improbable God is. I think that's very much beside the point. I am a very improbable person. If you try to calculate the a priori probability of Peter Atkins or myself existing, it's very small. But the point is we're actual. And so I feel that the real question to ask is not how probable is God, but is there evidence that God is actual? Now, Peter says there is design in the universe. It's mostly due to the human mind. That, to my mind, is a very interesting thing. He expects me to believe that nature stumbling through all these processes for a relatively limited time of four billion years or so. How many generations? Are, yes. And how many generations? Has stumbled on the very thing that does the designing, you see. And, and I find that simply a fantastic belief. But I can see that if you're a materialist uh, in your philosophy, you have to believe that. I don't have to believe it because I think materialism is false. And I think the very fact that we can do science is evidence that it's false. One of the very interesting things I read recently was, I think it was a, a book by John Gray, who's no sympathy with Christianity that I can see. But he points out that the very concept of truth, that you cannot get that from evolutionary processes because evolution serves reproductive success, not truth. But here, and I, here are Peter and myself, scientists, if you'll allow me to be one for a moment as a mathematician. We believe in truth. Now, it seems to me that is something that goes way beyond what the kind of description we're getting from Peter can deliver. Let's, let's go to another question. Thank you both for, for the vigorous uh, treatment of that one. Uh, four laws that drive the universe might be an obvious place to, to kick off a discussion, and perhaps we'll ask you first, Professor Atkins. Um, do laws necessi necessitate a lawmaker? No. Laws are our summary of experience. So, usually, most reliably, in the laboratory, but not necessarily. Uh, but, um, so, laws are just summaries of experience. And they emerge not because they are God-given, whatever that means, um, but because they are our observations of how an entity, be it an electron, be it a giraffe, um, finds a way of behaving. And it's a slightly um, obscure remark, I think, but um, the best laws, I think, are laws that we can express mathematically. And I think there are some wonderful mathematically expressed laws, like Newton's laws of gravitation and so on, Einstein's um, general theory of gravitation, general theory of relativity. But they are, are symbolic ways, those mathematically formulated laws are, are symbolic ways of summarizing observation. And so, if you like, an electron behaves. Um, well, let me give a, a, um, um, a, a more precise example of that, which comes to mind. You know, a simple law of nature might be that light travels in straight lines. 
or more, um, um, more generally, light travels in the path that takes the least time between the point of departure and the point of arrival. Uh, now that's a sort of a law of nature. Now, did God give that law to tell light that it should always travel in the path that gives the least time? Or did man give it? Or did light itself arrive at that law? And I think it's the last. And you can see why, because as soon as you... The first question you ask is, why does light know that this path is going to be the... Um, the, take the least time. It starts out on the journey, realizes it's made a mistake, comes back, chooses another path, and so on. And you can see that light might make an awful lot of mistakes before it decided on which was the path of least time. But as soon as you say, well, light is a wave motion, it's an electromagnetic wave passing through space, the wave goes up and down. You can imagine that light a light wave taking one particular path between A and B. And it will have neighbours and other neighbours. And if you look at the mathematics of it, or just think about the physics of it, then all the light that travels in a curved path ends up sometimes with the peaks, sometimes with the troughs, and they all cancel out. Whereas light that travels in a straight line has neighbours doing the same thing. But it turns out that the, all the peaks are almost in step, or all the troughs are almost in step for all the neighbours. So in other words, light doesn't travel in straight lines. It travels everywhere. But it annihilates itself if it travels by curved paths. And the only paths that survive are those that have neighbours that don't annihilate, which are straight line ones. And so man comes along and says, aha, light travels in straight lines. Light knows to itself that it doesn't. It goes everywhere without its... You can see how lawlessness, complete absence of control, just light going everywhere, leads to our perception of a law. And that's very interesting. So laws emerge out of chaos on their own. And of course, if you want to go and say, well, God made it go up and down as a wave, then that's up to you. But you can see how the nature of the entity actually can underlie the formulation of the physical law. Fascinating. Thank you. Professor Lewis, did you have a response on that? Well... I would first of all want to say that when you ask the question, do laws need a lawgiver? I would agree with Peter, there are, there are different kinds of laws. The, the prior question that needs to be answered is the one that we both agree is a big question, is why is there something rather than nothing? I do feel, however, and it's not a proof in the mathematical sense, but nothing in science is, that the elegant descriptions, the compressions, that are the mathematical laws, certainly are completely consistent with the idea that there is a creator who not only created but upholds the universe and has built into it regularities which we recognize and we codify and we encapsulate. Now some of those entities that we describe as laws may well arise, as Peter points out in, the, in, the, in connection with light, from the nature of the entities that God is ultimately responsible for. So the level in that sense of God's responsibility would, would be a question here. I think this is quite a complex question. But the underlying uh, notion for me is that the very fact that we can describe it in terms of laws, symbolic laws, abstract laws, which are, after all, in that sense, immaterial, is another pointer in the direction that there is a mind behind it. It certainly is not a pointer in the direction of atheism. Pure wishful thinking, absolute wishful thinking. It's the paradigm wishful thinking argument that you say, yes, we accept the whole of science, but I think there must be God anyway. But no, it's not at all. It's, 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 it's the other way around entirely. But perhaps what the discussion is pointing up is this. 
Um, when you earlier on, Peter, said there isn't a shred of evidence for God, I made the point, but we haven't taken it up at all, that science is not the only evidence I would want to bring into play for the existence of God. There's also history. There are specifically uh, the claims of, of Christ and what he said and what he did and how he lived, his resurrection in particular, and uh, daily experience of, of the reality of God. I would want to put that all into the pool of our thinking and not merely rest on science. It depends what you mean by science, of course. Uh, by science, I mean um, ex well, if, exploring the world. Oh, you, well, if you simply mean no, no, that, no, then no, science no, can no, cover no. everything. Well, yeah, no, I, I was going to finish the sentence. Um, exploring the world using publicly accessible information, um, sometimes under controlled conditions, but generating a network, a reticulation of concepts, if you like, that don't, even though they might flow from different rivers, mutually enhance where they mingle. So you would include history under that, for instance? I would include history insofar as history. Anything I, I, I would include anything reliable, in, including history. Um, in, I would even include the Bible. Mm. Um, because certainly the Bible exists. Exactly. But I wouldn't believe much in it. Uh, and I would certainly try to bring... Um, and I certainly don't believe in the resurrection, which you appear to believe in. I think that's baloney, obviously baloney. It's not I mean, obviously baloney. I think it's obviously baloney. I think, well, so, so much of you know, early Christianity is obvious baloney. But why is it obvious baloney? Come on, there was no evidence for it. But there is years. evidence for it. There's no reliable evidence for it. It's interesting, again, one of the books that sits there, mm. Francis Collins discusses precisely why he comes to believe in the historicity of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Mm. If Jesus didn't rise from the dead, we've got to explain the meteoric rise of, of the Christian church. We've Look got the, to explain the empty tomb. Well, the empty tomb can be explained in so many different ways. You know, like, you know, they simply forgot which place they put the body, things like that. I mean, there's also... But all those sorts explanations of have all been entered into by very sceptical people. Yeah. And what is very interesting, that some of the most sceptical have ended up believing in the resurrection because of their study. To say it's baloney, Peter, is a bit extreme. If there is a God who created the universe and he's interested... Oh, I agree. I mean, if there is a God, then anything goes. Anything? Anything, absolutely anything. If I were God and I was omnipotent, I'd certainly um, have fun. Well, perhaps one of the fun things God did was to create the universe that Indeed. you're delighted in I, exploring. I can, I can see, I can accept that if there is a God, then anything can happen at all. And it's, a, it's, it's, it's such a loose concept that... Uh, well, I, 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 that is why... I feel All that I science do. is well, not enough. If there is a God, then it wouldn't be surprising if no he revealed God, himself. Yeah. Just yeah. a moment. Yeah. Um, let yeah. me finish this time. Yeah. The, the biblical claim of the reason I'm a Christian is because I see evidence that God has revealed himself, particularly in Jesus Christ, in history. And secondly, that God can be experienced. And as I look, and I don't I, want to be by fooled. hallucinations and things like that. Not by hallucinations. That's, that's a theory that won't wash at all. You say 500 you, people saw him at once. 500 people don't have hallucinations. Oh, yes, they do. And the psych it's called mass hysteria. Ah, but wait a minute. The psychologists point out in connection with those documents that people see, uh, never see in hallucinations things that they're not expecting to see. No one expected Jesus to rise from the dead because no one believed in it quite right too. They were sensible in those days. <laughs> Gentlemen, I, I'd love to continue. But they came to believe in it because of the evidence no, they that came was presented in, they, to No, they came to believe in it because of the politics of, of Judea at the time. But half a minute, I didn't come to believe in it because of the politics of Judea. No, you came to Judea. believe in it because you were born in, born in Ireland. Well, that's a very interesting thing. <laughs> that I was born in Ireland, Peter, and my parents were Christians, but the biggest thing they ever gave me... They get you young, you see, no, you can't they, take it off. Just a moment, they allowed me to think. And my parents, contrary to most many parents in Northern Ireland, were the people that gave me 
atheist books to read as a teenager so that I could come to my own mature decision. Yeah. And one of the things that I found was that their Christianity was intellectually liberating beyond belief because it allowed me to think. So when I left home and went to Cambridge, instead of saying forget the whole thing, it was opening up the doors. But precisely because of the point you make, somebody in my first week at Cambridge said to me, do you believe in God? And then he said, oh, sorry, John, I forgot you're Irish. They yeah. all believe in God and fight yeah. about it. That was a decisive point in my intellectual journey in Cambridge. I decided on that day that what I'd like to do is get to know someone who doesn't believe in God, who's never been to church, whose parents don't believe in it. And I've been doing that ever since, comparing the two worldviews. So I would want to say yes, absolutely. I had a very positive experience of Christianity in Northern Ireland which was very unusual, I discovered subsequently. My parents were Christian, but not sectarian. Mm. They allowed me to think. But nothing in my investigation subsequently, and I've tried very hard indeed to read everything I can get my hands on by people like yourself. And what that has done is to confirm my faith that Christianity and science are not in contradiction at all, but they confirm each other very powerfully. To wrap this up, and we're out of time well before you're out of ideas or I'm out of questions, can, I, can we come to the very personal question? And, and can I ask you both, what is the, the emotional payoff? What is the emotional attraction of your, of your position? Oh. Um, as you experience life as an atheist, as a, as a Christian, what's, what's the reward in a sense? The sheer joy of seeing how the glorious, wonderful complexity of the world can emerge from an underlying extraordinary simplicity. Can, can, I, can I ask you a few more specifics? Uh, <laughs> yeah, to, to, to I mean, make that more complex as well. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Ockham might not like yeah. it. Uh, the, the, one question is, I mean, atheism is often portrayed as a, as a as a gloomy, hopeless kind of thing. And I know many atheists argue yeah. against that. Uh, no concept of life after death. Do, do some of those things worry you? Or is there a liberation in no accountability to a judge? No sense of being controlled by the... Well, let's put it this way. I'd, I'd, I'd love to be wrong. I'd, I'd love when I die to wake up, or whatever one does in a kind of spiritual sense, to find that I was wrong all along and that I've got a whole eternity of being um, sensate, as it were or whatever the afterlife consists of. I don't think anyone is quite sure about that. Um, uh, so, in a sense, I'd like to be wrong. But in an intellectual sense, I know I'm not, not wrong. I, I, I know that um, there is no afterlife, no evidence for it, one jot of evidence for it. Um, and it's, I find it really rewarding to know that the human mind can unravel the mysteries of nature and, mis and unravel them in a shareable way uh, so that with people with ears to hear can share in the delights of discovery that we the scientist have made. I mean science, the scientific method is just a straightforward simple method. Uh, it should have been discovered you know, thousands of years ago. But the, all it consists of doing is seeking reliable evidence, talking to other people, comparing notes, and building upon secure foundations. Mm -hmm. And in the modern idiom, expressing it mathematically insofar as things can be expressed mathematically. Mm -hmm. Because that sort of gives you, mathematics gives you extraordinary power to squeeze out implications from hypotheses. Um, and um, that gives me joy. And I certainly, it, 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 the other sort of joy you get is the realization that this is one's only life. And although I would not try to convert a recently bereaved widow in Bangladesh, that there was no God, because I would think that it's just simple humanity to let her go on hoping that there is a better life to come. Um, 
for a school child in our westernized countries, if Australia is the West, you know, um, <laughs> then um, it, it would be, um, it, I think it's a sense of liberation for them to realize that the hocus pocus of religion is false and that they can get deeper joy, more meaningful life from the truth that Thank the scientific method reveals. Thank you kindly. Professor Lennox, what's the payoff for you in your belief? Well, I would share Peter's joy at science unraveling the mysteries of nature, certainly, and the, and the mathematics. To my mind, that joy is increased by the fact that it is, so to speak, thinking God's thoughts after him. So I see that as part and parcel of one thing. But the second thing is, I think life is much bigger than science. And uh, that's why I'm sad at the way in which atheism compresses life into a one-dimensional world when there's a vast, the greater uh, world outside it. Because God is real and alive, I believe that the evidence shows that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and certainly the resurrection as a central fact of history for me is something that has played an extremely important role because I believe there is strong historical evidence for it, otherwise I wouldn't be a Christian for a moment. But secondly, it not only gives hope that this world is not all that there is, but secondly, it gives validity to a lot of other things. For example, we all have a moral conscience. We haven't even discussed morality. Mm -hmm. I find it impossible to give any explanation of why there are moral absolutes without God. But far more importantly even than that is that I do not believe our moral conscience is an illusion. Now, if death is the end, then it is the fact that the vast majority of human beings in the world will never see justice. They don't get it in this life and there's no afterlife in which to get it. But I believe that one of the evidences for God is not only the rational intelligibility of the universe, but its moral intelligibility. And therefore, the... We've just had a cut due to technical issues, but at least we've told you about it. And we're going to wrap up now with a three-minute summary from each presenter. And the question is, we'll, we'll start, Professor Atkins, with yourself. What's the emotional payoff or the reward of, of your position, of your belief? Joy. Um, the, the, the realization that uh, the human brain working in collaboration and developing ways of understanding nature can truly understand nature. Uh, and I think that's, that gives me great joy to realize that out of in this world where we're surrounded by glorious, wonderful, fantastic complexity, that it all springs from an underlying extreme simplicity. And it's the ability of science, that is people working together in a scientific mode, to be able to trace this complexity back to the acorn from which it springs. And in some cases, even be able to, able to do the opposite journey from the acorn to the forest of complexity. That's, that, that's fantastic. Um, I also think that it, it points to the fact that, um, you know, that as there is no afterlife, that's one of the worst delusions propagated by theologians, as there is no afterlife, then it means that one should really grasp the day, grasp the, the, the fact that this is one's only single opportunity to enjoy living and for people to throw away that uh, opportunity that is given by life is, is deeply sad. Um, I wouldn't try to dispel um, the hope of a newly bereaved widow in Bangladesh because I think that would be cruel. Uh, but a young child being brought up in, in the West should have his or her eyes opened to the truth about the nature of the world. Okay. Do you, have you ever wished you, you were wrong? Is, is there an attraction in the other... I'd love to be wrong. 
in a certain level. Intellectually, I don't want to be wrong because that would um, be, I'd look rather, rather silly. But um, emotionally, it would be great to be wrong and to wake up in one's coffin or whatever, one, however one gets out of it after one's died and discover that one's been embraced by the Lord God and that one now has an eternity of bliss to go um, to enjoy, although there is certain confusion about what the nature of that bliss will, will be. Um, I, and to realize that I will be conscious for eternity, um, looking at the weak meddlings perhaps of humans left still to trace out their scientific lives. Yeah, I'd, like, I'd really like to be wrong, but it great, gives me great satisfaction to know that I'm very unlikely to be wrong. Thank you. Thank you. Professor Lennox, what's the payoff? Well, I would use the same word as Peter, joy. But that joy has got several aspects to it. There's first of all the, uh, the joy of doing my work, of doing science, if you like, mathematics, and enjoying the unraveling of understanding the universe. In fact, I've got a telescope in my garden. I love looking at the stars and the sun and so on. But there's also the joy of knowing that one is investigating a created universe and one is in some sense understanding the genius of the God who invented it and created it like that. But there's an even bigger joy to me and that is the fact that God is not a theory but a person and we are persons, we are made in his image and therefore we can get to know him. And the biggest thing in my life is the fact that I know God through Jesus Christ, that he has revealed God being God incarnate and has given evidence of his claim to be God incarnate in rising from the dead uh, as a matter of history. And that enlarges my horizons enormously because, of course, it means that death is not the end. It also means that my moral conscience is not ultimately a delusion. Because if death is the end, it seems to me that there is no ultimate justice for the vast majority of people in the world. It's a very good thing to work for justice in this world. But the fact that ultimately humanity will be judged by God who became human in Jesus Christ and who has died and risen again in order to do something about the vast rift that is between humanity and God tells me that my conscience is very real and that justice will be done. And it's that relationship, I suppose, the payoff, if you put it this way, is that I can enjoy my work, my family, my relationships, and there's a sense in which this is only the beginning, the initial stage. So I have real hope because it is founded on evidence. I believe in evidence-based Christianity just as much as I believe in evidence-based science. Thank you both very much for putting your ideas with, uh, with such clarity and such passion. I've thoroughly enjoyed the discussion. I hope you have as well. And I hope our, our viewers have also benefited. Ultimately, uh, you will decide on the basis of what you hear, and uh, we wish you well in that quest. Thanks very much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Appreciate it.